Education economy is probably a fantasy, relying as it does not just on a serious commitment to economic equality and social welfare, but also to things like replication technology, interstellar trade, and cheap, clean, renewable energy sources like fusion. But even if it is a fantasy, it can still be instructive. Imagine how profoundly our lives would change if we no longer had to trade our labor for money in order to survive. Seriously, take a few seconds and imagine that. Your basic needs, food, clothing, housing, health care, are covered. You don't need to earn them. You don't need to pay for them. They are yours from the day you're born till the day you die. You can still work if you want, but you can choose the work you do based on what it means to you. If you want to work outside, you can work outside. If you want to be a builder, you can be a builder. If you want to write, you can write. If you want to paint, you can paint. Now imagine that it's like that for every other person on the planet, too. No hunger, no homelessness, no poverty. And in the absence of a profit motive, society is instead organized around principles of equality, tolerance, and social responsibility. As Captain Picard tells Lily in First Contact, we work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. That world would be virtually unrecognizable to us. And what does that say about the world we have now? So is it possible for us to realize something like the economy we see on Star Trek's Earth of the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th centuries? In his book Treconomics, Manu Sadia speculates that it might be. Sadia writes of the great British economist John Maynard Keynes, who identified scarcity as the fundamental economic problem. Writing in 1930, Keynes predicted that economic growth would put an end to scarcity and the struggle for subsistence within 100 years. That was overly optimistic, as it turns out. The global economy has not grown as quickly as Keynes predicted it would, and the end of the struggle for subsistence is not right around the corner for the vast majority of people. But that doesn't mean there's no reason to hope that we'll still get there someday. In Chapter 9 of Treconomics, Sadia writes, quote, Star Trek paints an ideal picture of late 20th century America and Europe, or rather of its expected trajectory. The political franchise has been expanded to all citizens. Poverty and crime have receded thanks to rational welfare policies. And people are finally free to enjoy life without worries. And on the final page of the chapter, Saudi writes, quote, Such a world is far from a guaranteed outcome. While public goods and abundance are spreading, so is economic inequality. We will need considerable efforts wisdom, and cooperation to steer society on a new course. The wealthiest among us will have to reallocate the bulk of their fortunes to society. Above all, we will need more public goods and more positive externalities. Star Trek teaches us that humanity's wondrous inventions do not fully realize their potential until they are freely shared. As Sadi himself acknowledges throughout his book, the economy of the Federation is science fiction, but unlike many elements of Star Trek, it's not an unattainable fantasy. We'll never be able to travel from star system to star system at hundreds of times the speed of light. And even if we could, whoever's out there waiting for us, they ain't Vulcans. But we could reorganize our societies in ways that allow everyone's basic needs to be met and detach our ability to survive from our ability to work. Right now, the wealthiest 26 people in the world own as much as the poorest 3.8 billion people. In the United States, there are several times as many vacant homes as there are homeless people. And despite there being enough food produced to feed every single person on the planet, nearly 800 million people suffer from hunger and malnutrition around the world. We don't have the practically inexhaustible resources of Earth in Star Trek's 24th century, but we do have the means to end hunger, homelessness, and extreme poverty 
if only we would put the resources we do have to better use. A bit earlier in that ninth chapter of Trekonomics, Manu Sadia writes, quote, The one thing I learned from watching Star Trek is that post-scarcity is not some kind of naturally occurring phenomenon or weather event. It will not fall into place. It is not preordained. Post-scarcity is a set of policy choices. Technological progress and economic growth cannot bring us to utopia on their own. Inventions do not arise in a vacuum. They are artifacts of society. They respond to people's needs and, sometimes, demands. How do the economics of Star Trek work? They work because the people of Earth, and beyond it, the Federation, decided that they cared more about basic rights and justice and quality of life than they cared about money. Right now, there are a million obstacles between a world organized according to those priorities and the world we have. But most of those obstacles are human-made. We put them up. We could take them down. We don't have to wait for another world war or for benevolent extraterrestrials to descend from the stars. We could start to do it right now. We could. All of that from a couple of lines that were played for laughs in Star Trek IV. Good job, Nick. <laughs>